saying God created. Okay, as we know, he created um, the light and the dark before he created the sun and the moon, and he created everything with his words, with vibration. There was a student a few years ago, uh, Jacqueline Kelly, who did, she actually won the, the thesis, the senior thesis competition, and she did this on vibration. And you can find things online too about what happens with um, vibration and how it actually can move things and do things. It's a really cool thing, but um, anyway, so on the sixth day though, he did something special. He did something different. Rather than speaking things into existence like he had done before, and, and keeping in mind, he may have spoken it into existence, but it doesn't conflict with science when it took time for those things to manifest, right? He created them just like you, you and your mind will create a project, a piece of artwork, but it takes time for that to be manifested. So God and science do not conflict. They actually agree. So in the beginning on, on the sixth day, he scooped up some terracotta. Terracotta is red clay. We've talked about that before in ceramics too. They actually used it um, and mixed it with some white clay and did like a special effect with it. But red clay is what God made Adam out of. So he leaned down, formed Adam out of the terracotta rather than just speaking him into existence. And ta-da, man was created. Now, even though, by the way, you're, you're, you're questioning my skills right now. I know you all are, no judging. Quick thing. So, uh, looking at Adam right now, there's something missing. His physical body is there, and his soul, which is your mind, your intellect, your character, is there, but we can't tell. Why? He's lifeless. He had to do one more thing that he did different than everything else to Adam. What did he do? Anybody know? scared or you just don't know I think y'all know because what he did is he breathed his spirit into him and Adam became a living thing Ta -da! Okay, got him. okay so then God gave Adam all the rules of the garden he said this is this and that is that and basically this is what you're supposed to do which was he his job to name all the animals and classify them which is science right that's what science is the study of data so he was responsible for naming the animals and classifying in groups and all those kind of things. Also, God told him about a tree that was in the middle of the garden called the tree of life. That tree he could freely eat from all the time, had beautiful fruit on it. But there were two trees, and I always question, why did God put that tree there? Because if he hadn't put it there, we would probably not be here right now. We would still be in the Garden of Eden. Uh, naked, but that's, that's a whole different story. Anyway, so uh, he said, here's the second tree, you're not to eat of this fruit because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? It's not the tree of good and evil, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, there's a difference because good and evil was already there. Good and evil was already created because God called the light good. So good is the light and the light is Jesus Christ. That's a, like a foreshadowing of what comes. But the knowledge of good and evil is what Adam did not have. Adam didn't know. He's in the Garden of Eden. His, all of his needs are met, he thinks, at this point. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so he didn't know anything about it. He just said, okay, God, gotcha. So Adam knew not supposed to eat of that tree. Okay, then Adam is out in the garden doing something, naming the animals, and he's pondering things and he sees things and he comes back to God and he says, hey God, I noticed something. Everywhere I see the animals and they have someone like them, but for me there is no one. Now guys, I like to put a little- Sorry, oh, Jim, okay. I just need to check with me, so we'll change it to him. Okay. okay, thank you so much. So I always, uh, okay, where was I, what was I saying? Oh, he says, God, out there, everybody has someone, but for me, there is no one. And so I always like to put a little jab on the guys here, you know, guys who you think that we irritate you, women irritate you sometimes, maybe your mom, maybe your sister, because we're different than you. God created us different, but you asked for it. 
literally Adam went to God and asked for it. Because why did God create male and female everywhere but except in God? You have to come over here, Jalen, right next to me. A little further away since I'm not mad. Um, so basically, uh, Adam realized he needed somebody, but God could have created female and male at the same time, and he did not. So there's that question, because he did everything else a different way. So God made him go to sleep. So glad you asked, Adam, because he's been planning it all along. Because he said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not. But here's the really cool part. So he puts him into a deep sleep. Now, if you're squeamish, you should probably not watch this keeping in mind that I am not God, so mine's not going to be as awesome as God, because, you know, the first two people, I mean, they were pretty amazing, I'm sure. That's the hottest couple ever created. But for us right now, I'm dealing with play and a time schedule. to him, ta-da, and Adam was like, whoa, okay, ooh la la, she is, and he said, she's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, he immediately recognized that they matched, okay, I mean, there were some differences, but they matched, they didn't have fur, they didn't have feathers, they were the same, okay, now here's a cool thing to think about, when God made, excuse me, let me make some notes, when God made Eve, he didn't add anything took a rib, a portion of the chest out, and then formed Eve. He didn't like put ingredients in there from the pantry or whatever and add some stuff. He took her out of Adam so all of his image was in Adam because it says that he made man in his image, his image and likeness. So that means um, everything that God is was in Adam and now it's in Adam and Eve. So if you have Adam in God's image by himself, and now it's Adam and Eve. Who's Bobby? Okay, that's fine. You sound like gum. It just makes me want gum. Um, anyway, so you have Adam and Eve together there in the image of God. There's a lot of cultures that say only man is in God's image, okay? But not ours, because we are not created like as an afterthought. We are taken out of Adam. So the, Sometimes I also joke, maybe we took a little too much out of Adam, you know, because, you know. But that's okay, because they're created completely different than us, so they have attributes that we don't. Now, we have some crossover attributes, that's fine. And everybody's a little bit different. But the, everything was in Adam and Eve, and before that, in Adam. Okay, so now, it's Adam's job to tell Eve about what? The rules. Okay? So... This is this, and that is that. He told him, but I think he might have left some things out, and I'll show you why in just a minute. So, they were in the middle of the garden where the two trees were. Not sure what they were doing. Maybe they were eating from the tree of life. But anyway, along came a serpent. A serpent had legs back in those days. They, here comes the serpent. And the serpent starts talking to Eve. Adam was there. The Bible says Adam was with her. Okay, so anybody who gives this sermon, Pastor Youth finally gave a sermon and, and, and with that eureka moment that Adam was not off in a field when this happened. Eve did not trick him. Eve did not like, you know, fail to tell them where the fruit comes. It was both of them in the garden. So the, the enemy, which is a serpent, comes to Eve and says, hey, isn't that pretty fruit? Okay, again, talking to the woman about how beautiful it is. Well, that's how we are. We're, we're created to help, and so we make things, take things and we create, and we make things more beautiful, and that's what we do. So why not tell us, hey, the fruit's beautiful. We want to please our family. We want to be pleasing to people, and so let's use the woman. So Eve's like, oh, yeah, you're right about that. But God says we are not supposed to eat the fruit or even touch it. So right there, 
Eve added something to what God said. God didn't say not to touch it. God said not to eat it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God said not to touch it. Did Adam speak up and say, oh no, Eve, just not to eat it. Adam did correct her. Adam just sat there. Nothing in the Bible says that Adam responded at all. So she says, you're right. Uh, well, so the enemy says, well, touch it and see. It's so beautiful. And so she did. She reached out and touched it. And the enemy says, well, what happened? Nothing. Why did nothing happen? Because God never said not to touch it. So she's like, you're right. So, okay. So she's starting to believe this, this little deceiving voice right here. So she decides, well, maybe if we can touch it and nothing happened, we can eat it. So she ate it. Guess what? Nothing happened. You want to know why? Because God told Adam not to eat it. So let's see what happens when Eve gives it to Adam. Now, my question is, again, Adam has said nothing. But Adam finally says nothing. He still says nothing. So Eve gave it to him, and I think, this is just my opinion, I think, you know, how guys are created very um, curious, and they like to uh, blow things up to see what would happen. I mean, that's that's literally part of their demeanor, is they're, they're uh, risk takers, you know, these kind of things. They're, they're the ones that they're strong as a gender, not to say there's not strong women, there are strong women, but as a gender, they're strong um, all around, and so they take risks and they um, venture outside maybe the security box that some of us will stay in. So, he ate the fruit. I think he was just trying to see what would happen to Eve, and since nothing happened to her, he said, okay, so he ate the fruit. Then their eyes were open. Then their eyes were opened, okay? Not before when Eve took the fruit, but when she gave it to him who was standing next to her. So when their eyes were open, they went and they hid. Uh, hid. Now I've told you a little bit about this in some other lectures, but um, they hid in the bushes and they made fig leaves for themselves to cover themselves. Okay, well, not a really good plan, but they were trying to camouflage because the first thing we all wanna do when we sin is to hide. And that's what they were doing. Because when their eyes were open, the, the, the new translation said they realized they were naked. Well, that doesn't work either because there were no clothes, there was no clothing, nobody dressed with clothes in the Bible. There were feathers and fur, but some of them had and scales, but some of them had nothing. They had smooth skin. So there was literally no reason for them to think, oh, Eve, we're not wearing any clothes. That's not what it meant. It meant we're exposed. We need to hide. And that is what that translation means. You go back to the original text and you realize it makes a lot more sense than what it means in the Bible. Maybe you haven't thought about that yet because there were no shopping malls back then. Anyways, so they went. Of course, we know the next part of the story. God comes and he says, what? Where are you, Adam? He knew where Adam was, but he wanted to see if Adam knew where Adam was. And he says, this woman you gave me. So he literally, even though he's the one that came up with it, he literally blamed God for Eve. You gave her to me, and then blamed Eve. She gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Okay, so he blamed God, then he blamed Eve. Well, then, of course, Eve blames what? The serpent. The serpent deceived me, told me this and that. And so God cursed all three of them. God cursed the serpent with no legs. No more legs for the serpent. God cursed Adam and Eve first Eve with childbearing. Now this doesn't necessarily mean childbirth because childbirth is nothing compared to having a teenager who you love deeply and desperately and they're now making their own choices and they're sometimes making choices that hurt themselves and others. That is the most gut-wrenching part of being a mom and a dad. So mom specifically childbearing, like having them, making sure they survive growing up. And then, of course, Guy, he's now going to have to toll the fields, whatever, by the sweat of his brow. In other words, weeds are going to grow up. In the Garden of Eden, there were no weeds. Everything was where it was supposed to be. The whole thing was balanced. But now the world has fallen because of their choice. And so it's going to be harder. So people who earn, even though women also earn the living, it's not like it's just guys that go out in the field anymore. But the men are the ones that, that are 
literally trying to, to flourish with the, the success of their jobs or business, whatever, and it's hard. Growing upstream, right now, everything's hard. People losing their jobs, all those kind of things. So then they were thrown out of the garden into the miry pit. And that is where our story begins on the wheel. So you might get a little splash though. Try not to, but. So I'm going to fake the fact that I'm taking miry pit clay out of there, but I've already got a lump of clay prepared. So what I'm gonna show you is how to throw on a potter's wheel. This is a potter's wheel. This is the bat. This is the head of the potter's wheel. And this is the clay. This is where our story begins because every single one of you born is born into a miry pit, meaning because of every baby born after Adam and Eve had the seed of sin in them because of them. So it's not your fault. Now because you have the seed of sin in you, as a seed does, it grows a tree which bears fruit and therefore it bears fruit of sin in your life. And that is why sometimes you make bad choices. Basically the whole walk of Christian is to learn how to avoid those bad choices. All right, so. That is called throwing. That is the whole thing. That's all it is. So now I'm going to the first go to the first stage because uh, lifting you out of the miry pit is the first thing. You, a miry pit in real life is a big, dark hole with slippery sides because it's filled with clay. And back in the day, they would have two people that would go into the field and one would go down in the hole and the other one would stay up at the top. So if it was time to go, the one in the hole couldn't get out by himself. It's too slippery. But the one on top would be able to help him. So the one on the bottom said, hey, friend, I'm ready to get out, help me out. So he would look up to the light and the warmth and his friend would be up there and he would throw him a rope and he would help him climb out. Well, the miry pit is where we start and if we look up and see the light, the light being Jesus Christ, he will throw a rope down, pull us up, and he will place our foot upon a rock, which is the whole thing um, I just did. A rock, back in those days, the symbolism of that, back in the original text, is about a potter's wheel, okay? This is obviously not rock, but back in those days, it was two rocks, one at the bottom, that you would kick like this to make it spin on the top, and it had a, a metal pole between them, and it literally just would spin like that. So, set my foot upon a rock, the rock being Jesus Christ, he's the the one that's firm foundation and he would establish our comings and goings so the first thing god has to do when i am finally on his potter's wheel is to center me because the center of the universe is god anything that's not centered in god is out of order and it's not going to work right it's going to be like a flat tire bumpy road if i try to throw a pot before i center this one side's going to be too thick the other side's going to be too thin it might fall apart those of you from you know what I'm talking about so centering is the most important part of it so I am going to uh, secure myself in what I call a trinity it's going to be a triangle I've got elbow hands elbow and every part of me is going to be together and working together my hands aren't going to be separated so that the clay can decide which one it wants to listen to this hand or this hand if I do that obviously I'm right right-handed so I'm going to have a stronger right hand than a left hand and so if if I don't work them together it's going to throw the whole thing off center and then I can't do it through the pot. Kind of like you guys when you want to do something and you know which parent's going to say yes. Which parent's going to give you the cat? Which one's not? <laughs> so you play your parents against each other like that? Don't do that guys. You want your parents united. Okay, divide and conquer is a bad deal. So, I'm going to use my elbow and my hands together and I'm going to press in until that clay does what I want it to do, okay? So I'm gonna do it one more time just to make sure it's centered. You can see that it has stopped wiggling, jiggling, but I'm gonna do it again just to make sure. Okay, now once it's centered, do all kinds of things with it. You can pull it up, you can push it down, and I usually do this to make sure it's actually centered. Nothing worse than throwing a pot in front of people and something going wrong. 
few years ago, I did this at First Baptist, and I had four times to do it, and one time it caused a little bit of an issue, but I was able to do it. So you got the big old cameras that come down on you. It was awesome. Anyways, so that was that was basically centering. Now this clay is ready for me to make it into something. Okay, so because I was in my Trinity, my hands aren't fighting. It's kind of like you know, a Trinity is three parts. You got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Never does the Father, God, argue with the Holy Spirit, or does Jesus argue with the Father? They're always in agreement. So you have to always be in agreement. If I am the center of the universe for this clay, I am God to this clay, I have to be in unity with myself. So I can't be sitting over here doing this or that, or I can't be doing this with my elbow up in the air, has to be down. So anyways, some things that we can do that we don't want to do. Okay, so we're going to say stage one is over, it is centered. Now the second thing I'm going to do is give it a heart, okay? Because we now know with technology, which we didn't even know back in my day as much as we know it now, first thing that happens when a baby is conceived in its mother's womb, it, it gets a heart. It gets a heartbeat. It literally starts beating way before they thought. They used to think around six, eight weeks, they would they would have a little stethoscope and they could hear the heartbeat, maybe, if the, if the baby was in the right place. But now, they can tell very early, they can see the heartbeat. So the first thing we give it is a heart, and actually the word heart of a vessel is not something that Collins came up with. It is literally a ceramic term for the, the opening of the vessel. So, I'm gonna put a little bit of water on there. I'm gonna get, again be in my trinity, put my finger on the top. And I'm gonna give it a heart. Now, can you see the bottom of that heart? No. So, I, the potter, can see the heart of my vessel, but you guys, man, we'll call you mankind, man, people, cannot see the, the heart of my vessel. What would you have to do? I usually do have you come up to me to do this, but what would you have to do to see the bottom of my heart? You'd have to get closer to me to see the, okay. So I know here at the First Academy, we do not judge each other. Although, judging isn't really what the Bible is against. Because it says if you must judge, judge righteously. It also says you can tell a tree by its fruit. If I have three daughters, if somebody came to the door with a um, hatchet in their hand and um, a, a, a mask covering their face and maybe blood dripping on their shirt somewhere and asked to see my daughter, I would say no. Unless I know that they were in a theater production and just came straight from there and I knew the person. So I have to make a judgment call right there, and I judge. Is that what the Bible means I shouldn't do? Oh, I shouldn't judge you. Angela, you have a visitor. No, you have to make judgments based on you know things like that. Tell a tree by its fruit. What it does say, though, is if you must judge, judge righteously, okay? God judges the heart. So I can't judge the, the heart of that person Though I can judge the fruit of it, and it, it's not something I'm going to let my daughter go out with, unless, again, he just came from a theater production, and that is his costume. Okay, so you being the mankind, and me being the God that can see the, the, the heart of this, you'd have to draw closer to me, but man looks on the outside appearance. God looks on the heart. So for you to see that, you'd have to draw close to me. Now, I'm going to also make this heart bigger, because as this thing starts to grow, that heart is way too small. I'm going to stop talking for a minute, because I can only do, you can't talk while you're on the potter's wheel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I see, yeah, yeah, see, on the hands, ah, see. Um, so I'm going to pull out and make this heart bigger. You ready? but it's a little bit bigger. So I'm going to also make sure that the heart is very strong. This is now not just a heart. This is an opening of the vessel. This is the mouth. Y'all just saw that in the test. This is the mouth. And then you have, I don't have a neck, but I have a body. So. Okay. Now that was stage two. We are now going to go to the lifting stage. Which is 
only going to work if I centered it and opened it properly. I'm going to slow it down and I'm going to be at total peace with this pot because it's not bumping and rolling in my hand. And I'm going to start lifting the side. I'm going to take a little bit off the foot just to make sure that it's going to be centered. What's going to happen now is what we call pruning. Hopefully, yeah, there it goes. Pruning is what God does when something's not good for us. Kind of like when you're a two-year-old and you want ice cream every day and your parents say, no, it's not good for you. So God will also remove things from our lives that are causing distress and that are not good for us. So I'm going to do that a few times. Maybe not anymore. Maybe just the first throw, uh, first lift. I'm also going to bridge the top, make sure this top stays nice and even. So the rest of this is just bringing this pot to its purpose. Your purpose is designed in each one of you. Now if we had a little longer time, I would make a big one for you. But since we have 40 minutes instead of 45 minutes, I had to use a teeny tiny little piece I don't want to run out of time. Does anybody know what time we get out of this? Five minutes. Five minutes? Oh, perfect. So I can keep lifting this until I'm ready. But here's what's going to happen. I will, I will finish this verbally, and then I'll finish the pot so that in case the bell rings. When this pot is finished, it, it has no value if it stays on the wheel because it's made out of clay, if I try to drink out of it, it's going to turn back into mud, and I'm going to be drinking a lot of mud. So it can't stand on its own. It's going to be too fragile if I let it dry out. We've talked about what happens with dry clay and wet clay and the difference in that. So I have to do something to it that's going to make it strong, and that is the fiery furnace, okay? 2,000 degrees or more, I'm going to heat up this clay until all the impurities are out of it. Everything that's inside of it that would cause it to be weak is going to be gone. Any organic material, leaves, twigs, bear poop, whatever's in there is going to be gone. Okay? But what's going to be left is lasting. As you saw in that video that you just did a while back, um, clay is lasting. So when they're doing archaeological digs, they find clay, but they don't find baskets. They don't find tapestries. They find clay because it lasts, because it's been through the fire. So the fire is also another uh, analogy for what every single one of you have gone through. There's people in this room who've gone through some fires that I haven't gone through. There's people in this room that haven't gone through a fire yet. A fire could be something like you cheated and you got caught on an exam. That's your own personal fire. Or maybe your parents are divorcing or divorced. Huh? Or maybe you lost a loved one. Right now, in the middle of this COVID, Awful. I don't know what else to call it. The mental health is just not even as bad. It's worse than it was when for high schoolers even before. So you guys are experiencing things that um, like are illuminated even bigger because of the separation and isolation from everything and the fact that you have to all wear these masks. So don't judge a person by the way they act or look until you know their heart because they may be going through something that you don't know. I try to do that with my students before I think you're, I, I knew Jalen before he was in my class this year. He was a little bit obnoxious. He'd come in my room all the time and who, who were you visiting? Uh, Blake. Blake and yeah, that one class, yeah. He'd come in and visit this one class and I'd have to give him a visitor pass and he'd stay too long, blah, blah, blah. But he was happy and he was always positive so I knew he was a good person, but you know, I didn't know him. Now he's in my class and I have learned a lot, and, and you guys too, I've learned a lot more about you. And I can sometimes sense when something is not quite right. And maybe maybe you can talk to me about it sometimes. I do have students that come and talk to me about it. Maybe um, I'll just pray for you. But whatever it is, you going through a fire is gonna make you stronger. You just have to survive the fire. When you come out, then you're going to be a, a piece of bisque. Remember when we um, talked about the stages of clay? You've got a piece of bisque just like this, but even this is not going to hold water because it's porous. So what do we do to it to make it seal up? 
We glaze it. So glaze, he puts this uh, glaze on top of us and seals us, makes us ready, and then we can become something that he has already uh, destined us to become. So that is pretty much what I'm teaching you on this, on this potter's wheel. So if anybody is not, is still, still in the miry pit and hasn't looked up and seen the light, I would love for you to come talk to me about it because I don't want anyone to leave my course, ceramics one, especially if you're not taking ceramics two, without knowing Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Because honestly, right now, what you're going through is a fire. COVID is a fire. And even if you haven't had other fires in your life, this one's a big one for every single person. The whole world is in this fire. And we need Jesus. And if you're trying to do it without Jesus, it's like rowing upstream with one paddle. You're not, you're not literally not utilizing the biggest influence in your life that can make it easier. So that is pretty much it. I'm going to finish this pot, and y'all can just hang out for a little bit while I do it. <laughs>